writing the introduction for Sheldon was a bit challenging because it looks like I, we will introduce two, three people, not one. Sheldon has a Bachelor of Computer Science at, uh, in compu uh, Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo. He, ha he also has a Master's of Technology in Theology and Philosophy from the University of Toronto with a thesis exploring epistemological connections between neuroscience, moral philosophy and metaethics. Then he studied creative writing at, uh, with Oxford University. He then joined the Montreal Institute of Genocide and Human Rights Studies and completed a professional training program on prevention and mass atrocities. Actually, this is the second time uh, he's joining us. Last time when we had the honor to having him as a speaker, his talk was the role of AI in the prevention of mass atrocities. Unfortunately, we don't have a recording, but we have his slideshows on our website in case you wanna have a look. He was also the adjunct lecturer at the University of Waterloo, where he worked with the optometry department in the area of dynamic infrared photoretinoscopy, a novel technique for detecting eye deficiency in the children. Throughout his career, he has applied emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence to the enterprise. First, in his capacity as CTO at Infusion, a company he founded out of school with uh, five partners that grew to 650 people and that was acquired two years ago. He's now the CEO of Darwin AI, a cutting edge AI startup based in Waterloo, whose technology stemming from years of scholarship by the academic team of the University of Waterloo uses AI to build AI. His topic for today is computational creativity, the implications of machine that can imagine I can only imagine what he will talk about today, so I would like to invite him on the stage. Okay, thank you, Dragos. Um, you know, whenever I get a grandiose introduction like that, I think back uh, years ago. Uh, years ago, uh, I got a, uh, some award at Waterloo, and I came home with my wife, and I was feeling all proud and, you know, uh, accomplished. And uh, she came in later, and you know, I thought she was going to congratulate me. And she's like, you know, the toilet's clogged. Here's the plunger. Go fix it. Um, which brought me right down to earth, which is what uh, a wife does. Um, so our, our talk today is on truly a, fas a fascinating topic. Um, you know, of all the talks I give, I think this is one I, I enjoy the most, because it really is and it involves the intersection of so many things that fascinate me. Uh, artificial intelligence, engineering, creative elements, as you guys know, just now I, I did a degree in creative writing as well, existential questions, and so let, let's dive in, because there's just so much good stuff here. So in terms of our agenda, the first thing I'm gonna do is just give you an overview of the cutting edge uh, elements of artificial intelligence, uh, which really ends with deep learning. So we'll talk just a little bit about the current state of AI, and this might be repeat for some of you, uh, but it is you know, a good kind of baseline to, to get started. Then we'll talk about creativity itself. One of the challenges of asking the question if a machine can create something creative is how do we define what creativity is, which is a challenge. Um, then we'll talk about computational creativity itself. We'll look at some state-of-the-art uh, accomplishments around uh, computational creativity. And then we'll talk about something called generative design. So let's begin. Now the first thing I want to do is just uh, have some precision around vocabulary because oftentimes you'll see these three terms used interchangeably um, and incorrectly. And it's important to understand how they relate to one another. And so the first thing to realize is that the most encompassing of these terms is artificial intelligence. And when we say artificial intelligence, what we are talking about is the ability of artificial entities to exhibit behavior that we would classify as creative from a human standpoint. That was the definition when the fathers of AI came together in 1956 at Dartmouth. Um, you know, that's what they aspired to. Now, we have many forms of artificial intelligence beyond machine learning and deep learning. There's uh, robotic process automation. There's expert systems. But probably the most uh, powerful form and certainly the most uh, popularized form of artificial intelligence today is machine learning. And then within machine learning, you have a subset, which is deep learning. So what is machine learning all about? Machine learning is basically the ability of machines to infer complex behavior based on the analysis of data, right? 
So if you think about classical computer programs or computer programming in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, even now, it was very precise. It was very algorithmic. You know, you have a certain set of steps, and the machine is really performing a sequence of, of operations with mathematical precision that the programmer specifies. Um, machine learning says, instead of a person defining the behavior of the system, here's all the data, and let's use some clever techniques to appropriate and understand that data and behave according to that data. And what's not widely appreciated is that Machine learning was really made powerful by two things that happened in the mid-2000s. Because the scholarship and the theory behind machine learning has been around for decades. But two things happened. The first was, all of a sudden, programmers had access to tremendous amounts of computational power. And that was made possible by means of the cloud. So if you think about what you have access to in AWS or Azure, literally it's supercomputing power that programmers in the 90s didn't have access to. So that was one factor. But the second, more important factor, was labeled data, right? Because of Google and Bing and social media, suddenly, if you wanted 100,000 pictures of a cat, it wasn't insurmountable to be able to get that type of labeled data. And so those two things in combination really um, you know, fueled the machine learning theory. And the essence of machine learning is that you are asking a system to infer behavior where that behavior cannot be described by a concrete set of rules, right? So that's in contrast to expert systems, which have maybe 100 or 200 rules. You are simply saying to a machine learning system, here's all the data. You figure out the behavior based on that data. Now, within machine learning, we have deep learning, right? And deep learning, as some of you know, is based on neural networks. And so to understand neural networks, we actually have to understand the human brain. Because neural networks, when they were first envisioned, were simply virtual constructions that were based on the human brain. And so in your head right now, inside, lodged in your cranium, is a three-pound packet of tissue that is widely considered the most awesome device in the cosmos. It has about 100 billion neural cells called neurons. It has 100 trillion axons that connect those neurons together. And there is an electrochemical dance or signaling that goes on between these axons and the neurons. And that electrochemical dance is the basis for human life as we understand it today, right? It's responsible for your mental computations, for consciousness, your emotional content, and so forth. And so the creators of neural networks, really what they were trying to do was create complex structures, electronic virtual structures that emulated the cognitive capability of the human mind. And the most uh, ambitious of these structures are several layers deep and have millions or sometimes billions of parameters, hence the term deep learning. Now, what is important to appreciate is that they don't even you know, closely uh, approach the complexity of the human brain. Right? They're about a thousandth as complex. But nonetheless, they are still incredibly complex. And in the past three to five years, these deep learning neural networks have started to do some remarkable, remarkable things. Right, and there's many types of deep learning neural networks that you will read about if you get into the scholarship. There's CNNs, RNNs, LSTMs, and so forth. So what are some of the incredible things that neural networks can do? Well, first of all, and this is probably the first thing they did at a really high level, was they can recognize the content of images. Right? So given a picture of an image, it can tell you with a certain confidence and probability what this is a picture of. And they can now go further than that. They can tell you, given a picture, they will describe the contents of the picture for you in colloquial English. Now, some of the makers of these systems uh, claim that these neural networks are better than human beings at you know, recognizing pictures. And it, de it, it depends on what you consider better. They are better insofar as they can be more precise. So if given a picture of, let's say, you know, uh, a horse, it can not only tell you that's a horse, it'll tell you the exact species and where it was located and that type of thing, but they also can be really bad, right? So there was a computer scientist, I believe he's Austrian, uh, Moravec, who came up with a claim known as Moravec's paradox, which states that when it comes to machines, they can do things really well that we struggle at, very advanced computation, but they also fail at very, very basic things. 
Okay, and to illustrate Moravec's paradox, consider this right here. And this is an image combination that neural networks still fail on disastrously. Right? You give this to a three-year-old or maybe a four-year-old, they'll be able to figure it out. But you know, neural networks cannot tell the difference between a blueberry muffin or a chihuahua. Right? This is another one. The butt of a dog or bread. So the thing with neural networks and deep learning neural networks, they're fantastic. But when they fail, they usually fail egregiously. And so think about that in the context of self-driving cars and the proliferation of these systems. It's really interesting. Nonetheless, what are some of the other cool things they can do? They can translate language um, approaching the level now of a, of a you know, skilled human translator. Because unlike a word-based translation, which translates word for word or phrase for phrase, they can now have the entire paragraph be the input into the neural network, and they can pick up on idioms and relationships between the words and so forth. OK, does anybody know what this is a picture of? The Hydron Collider, right. These are the patterns that we get when we you know, smash subatomic particles together at almost the speed of light. And based on the debris, we get real insights into the fundamental questions of the universe from a physical perspective. And so deep learning is now being used to try to you know, run through the thicket of this data to better understand trajectories and give us you know, insight into fundamental scientific questions. Okay? They can better detect metallic defects. Like there's almost every day, it seems, there's a new um, usage for deep learning that we didn't think about before. Here's the, here's the most advanced thing that I saw recently. So, Neural networks can be given a picture of an image. You can query the neural network a question in the English language and get back a response. Now, it's still nowhere as advanced as a human being, maybe on the level of a you know, three, four-year-old. But think of what's required here. Think of like the bottom left picture. You know, is this person expecting company? Like that's a subtle you know, question. How do you determine that? And how do you understand the question? So there's a lot of nuance here. So they're really starting to understand contextual things, which is fascinating. OK, does anybody know what this event was? What was this? AlphaGo. Why was this so significant? This happened in 2016, right? Some of you might remember that in 2016, DeepMind, at the time they were a subsidiary of Google, they still are, uh, created a machine called AlphaGo that played the world champion Lee Sedol in the game of Go. And what was so fascinating about this, this event is incidentally why I really started paying attention to deep learning. Experts weren't predicting that uh, a machine was going to beat the world champion at Go till 2030 or even 2050, depending on who you talk about. And when this match took place, most people predicted that Lisa Dahl would win four games to one. And the exact opposite happened. OK, there's a beautiful film on Netflix that you can watch. Um, that shows this, you know, this whole match from really a human perspective. And what was so incredible about this was not only that they did this in 2016, but the playing strength of AlphaGo was almost exponential. Right? A few years prior, it played at the strong amateur level, and suddenly by 2016, it played at the world championship level. And if that wasn't enough, a year after this took place, DeepMind then took a system called AlphaGo Zero, and they trained it to play Go only by playing itself. The original AlphaGo learned by looking at the best human games. That was its training data. AlphaGo Zero started from scratch. And within 21 days, it basically became better than AlphaGo and reached like superhuman capabilities in Go, which was just f fascinating. And of course, not stopping there, the makers uh, of DeepMind then, play, then trained AlphaGo Zero to play chess. And within, I think it was 48 hours, it became better than the best chess engines. Truly a generalized system. Quite remarkable. And now DeepMind is turning their attention to practical problems in the scientific realm. Okay, for example, they recently entered their system in a scientific uh, contest around protein folding and beat the competition senseless. And this is a fundamental problem in science that has to do with the synthesis of drugs and understanding disease. So it's now encroaching in real practical areas beyond games. Okay, a lot of excitement coming out of DeepMind. Now, one of the things to think about is that deep learning is very powerful, but there is a tendency for people to think it's the solution to everything. Right? There's that old saying that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Where deep learning excels is where you have a lot of data 
and you have a concrete quantifiable problem that you are trying to tackle. Right? So a very good example of deep learning is something like this. Right? So recently scientists in the UK used deep learning to predict the relative toxicity of chemicals in animals. Right? A lot of data available, easy to measure, easy to verify, uh, you know, perfect problem for the deep learning space. Okay? Let's think about something that isn't so perfect. Okay? So what is this? It's obviously two people playing soccer, but I, I mean something else. What is this? It's the World Cup. It's the World Cup what? Not just the World Cup. It's the final, the final of the World Cup, right? Croatia versus France. So prior to the World Cup, a bunch of academics got together, and they put together 26 machine learning and deep learning systems to try to pick the winner or the two finalists in the World Cup, and all of them failed, right? So after the World Cup, they had a conference, which ironically I think was in Russia, where they tried to analyze what went wrong. How did we get this so wrong? And finally, in a moment of clarity, one of the academics said, why do we think we could have gotten this right? How many people here who watch soccer picked France versus Croatia in the final? OK, at least none of you are liars, right? I remember I've done, I've done this before. I'm like, really? Most machines here picked you know, France, Germany, or Brazil. Why is this such a bad problem for deep learning or any mathematical system? Why, why is it so horrible? Yeah. Not enough data. There's been, what, 12 historical or whatever World Cups? That's the one problem. Chance. What's that? Chance. Chance. Yeah. Accident. Think of all the things that go into determining who wins a soccer game. Bad weather, bad refereeing mistake, uh, somebody slips on a freak accident, superstar player has a fight with his girlfriend the night before, doesn't sleep, and is sluggish. Like a million things can happen that you can't measure. Right? This is a complex system that can only be modeled with itself. And so it has what we call many confounding variables. Right? So some things deep learning is phenomenal at, some things it's not so good at. And so that's important to keep in mind. OK, let's turn our attention now that we are kind of up to the state of the art in artificial intelligence to computational creativity. And I'm going to start with a quick story. As Dragos mentioned, um, after doing a number of things, I took a writing program at Oxford University, creative writing. That's my class right there in 2008. So wow, that was 11 years ago. That's me. A little bit thinner, hair not as gray. Um, and so why am I telling you this? Well, every year at Dartmouth, there is a contest called the Turing Test in the Creative Arts. And what they do is they challenge computer scientists and other people in this domain to create artificial intelligence which generates creative artifacts. And so you can see here, you know, to produce stories, poems, uh, DJ mixes and so forth, right? So let's focus on the poetry element of this contest. This was the entry, or one of the entries, in 2016. And so the way it works is the machine is given a topic or a theme, and it has to generate you know, the equivalent of a Shakespearean sonnet. So if you read this one in 2016, people picking up electronic chronic, the balance like a giant tidal wave, never feeling supersonic or reaching any very shallow grave, this sounds like something my brother would write after you know, engaging in some recently legal substances. Um, let's look at the entry in 2017. OK, so just take a moment and read maybe the first two paragraphs. So when I read this, I thought, let me try a little experiment. I'm going to take this entry. And I'm going to send it to some of my close friends in my Oxford class, claiming I wrote this, and I'm going to ask for their feedback. Okay? And the first thing I should mention is that my classmates at Oxford, one of the things you learn if you endeavor to be a writer is that you have to check your ego at the door and really take criticism honestly and in the spirit of humility. And likewise, to help your fellow writers, you cannot hold back. Right? If you just give them wonderful feedback, nobody really develops. Right? Somebody said, writing is really the act of rewriting, and they were right. So I gave them this poem, and I asked for feedback. And this was the response from my Oxford classmates. Number one, inventive and alluring. The randomness gives it a palpable surrealness as if a dream were painted in words. Number two, I say, very good, sir. It has the feel of poems from the days of old. 
I think the use of ten syllable lines is very effective. I like the way it conjures up suspense and the personification of silence. Haunting and evocative might just be me, but echoes of Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening are washing all over me. You can tell these are writers. I mean, gosh, could you be any more dramatic, really? <laughs> Beautiful Sheldon, the prose is both powerful and suggestive. And finally, a mediocre effort at best. Suggest you deploy your talents to more accessible art forms, such as short stories and creative nonfiction. Nobody liked this person. That's why they always ate lunch alone. <laughs> but think about this for a moment. We have a poem here that was produced by a machine that convinced four out of five skilled writers, I might add, that it was actually a good piece of, of poetry and a good creative work. So could you argue that we've already reached the summit of computational creativity? We already have the ability of machines to create creative artifacts that you know, people in the domain consider um, accomplished. Well, a couple of caveats, right? Notice that there was one entry here, um, the Digilet competition, where people had to generate short stories based on entries. There wasn't one entry into this contest. If you think about a poem, right, like cadence, it has a certain mathematical structure to it. If you give me a poem and it sounds nice, I'll tell you it's good. I might not know what it means, but I'll tell you it's good. When you read literature, that's very different, right? So yes, poetry sort of gets us there, but we're really far away, as we'll see, from other forms of creative expression. And here's the big challenge with computational creativity. This is my... Uh, little thing that shows geometry. Believe it or not, the problem resolves to a geometry problem. What do I mean by that? Machines are very good at taking high dimensional data and reducing it to low dimensional data. So a picture of a horse, 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels, analyzing that and collapsing that into a couple of bits which tell you whether or not it's a horse, right? They are not good at going in the reverse direction. OK, similarly, let's say, for example, I had an essay in front of me, and I, you know, let's say it was 5,000 words, and I gave it to everybody in this room, and I said, after reading this, write me down five words about what this essay is about. And we tallied the results. Probably there would be commonality in, let's say, three of the five words, right? We would all kind of reduce down that high dimension to low dimension. Let's say I did the reverse. Let's say I gave you each a piece of paper, and I said, write me a short story, 3,000 words, and the theme is um, you know, wizard, orphan, muggle, et cetera, et cetera, right? We would have vastly different stories from that seating. Some would be maybe very good. Some would make no sense. Few of us in this room probably were, would write Harry Potter. So that is the challenge of computational creativity from an algorithmic point of view, going from low dimensional data to high dimensional data. So when we talk about computational creativity, what we are talking about is the ability to do one of three things, right? So it's a multidisciplinary enterprise that involves AI, philosophy, psychology. There are three things we are trying to do. Number one, and this usually gets the most attention, the artificial generation of creative artifacts. Number two, assisting and augmenting human artists with their own creative tasks. Can technology enable artists to do things that they couldn't do before? And if you think about something like musical instruments, it's not really technology, but it is a tool that's made that enable new forms of creative expression. And finally, enabling new forms of creative expression altogether, as I just mentioned. And it should, as a corollary, enrich our own understanding of the creative process. That would be nice, too. Okay? So before we get to computational creativity, let's talk about creativity itself. Right? Because one of the things, if we're going to say and claim that a machine is creative, we have to understand what are the standards by which we're making that claim. So, how many people would classify this, show of hands, as creative? OK, so about maybe 5 7% of us. OK, this was drawn by a budding young artist named S. Fernandez or Sheldon F. I drew this. This is the bookmark I drew uh, when I was 8 years old in grade 2. It was a contest to design a bookmark, and I remember being really proud of myself that I discovered this pattern of roses and mountains and so forth, and then I realized that many other artists had done the same thing, right? Now, if you ask the question, is this creative? To me, it was creative. To my parents, it was creative. To very few people in this room, legitimately, 
was a creative. So one of the questions of art is this paradox. And I, my art history teacher in one of my classes said this. A work of art is beautiful because it gives us pleasure. That's one claim. Or do we feel pleasure because it's beautiful? In other words, where is the, where is the, the ob objectivity behind declaring that something is creative? And so here are some common definitions of creativity. Okay, and you'll see a lot of overlap. New, novel, process, pattern, imagining, originality. The framework that I, less, I like best for creativity is done by um, somebody named Margaret Bowden, who said, creativity is the ability to create novel and valuable ideas. And valuable can be interesting, useful, beautiful. And she said there's two types of creativity. There's P creative, which is new to the person who did it, i.e. me drawing a bookmark when I'm eight years old. And then there's H creative, which is the first time we see this level of creativity in history. And she moreover said there's really three types of creativity when we think about this process. So number one, there's something called combinatorial creativity. And that is uh, the combination of familiar ideas in an unfamiliar way. Right? So examples are imagery and so forth. The best example I like, does anybody know what, where this is from, this clip? Who framed Roger Rabbit? This came out in 1988, before many of you were probably born. And so it starts off as a you know, cartoon that I would have watched on Sunday mornings. This is how the movie starts. And you know they're doing things, and then Roger Ebert's writing his review on this, and he goes right at this moment in the film, something happens, a human walks into the scene, talking to the cartoons, and we realize that we are departing into a new medium that we have just never seen before. This was the first time in the mainstream that you had human actors intermingling, intermingling with cartoons, and it was fundamentally different. We'd just never seen this before, right? So a combination of familiar things in an unfamiliar way. That's combinatorial creativity. Okay, then there's something called exploratory creativity. And this is creativity that stretches the boundaries of an established domain, right? So as it says here, a person moves through the space exploring it to find out what's there, including previously unvisited location. And its most interesting cases discovers both the potentials and limits of that space. A good example of exploratory creativity is this man here, Shakespeare, the bard. Uh, there's a beautiful article that you can find online that's, uh, don't let its title fool you, Shakespeare's genius is nonsense. It's actually about how his genius is very much uh, true. And it examines all the you know, interesting ways that Shakespeare employed the English language to dramatic effect. The layered meanings, the puns, the symbolism. Um, what's not often appreciated about Shakespeare, he was such a brilliant writer, we often forget that he was also a philosopher of the highest order. The Atlantic Monthly Magazine had a, had a, a survey a few years ago of what was the greatest speech, historical or fiction, ever given. And in the fictional realm, the to be or not to be Hamlet speech um, one, and someone wrote that to be or not to be speech from Hamlet boils down the essentials of life to a few magnificently poetic p uh, paragraphs. And finally, there's something called trans transformational creativity. And this is what is generally considered the highest form of creativity, where a space or a style is profoundly transformed. Okay, the person comes up with ideas that are fundamentally new, and we can't imagine the space having existed without their contribution once we hear about it. Here we're talking the very apex of human achievement, right? We're talking about Einstein, whose insights into the relationship between space and time gave us fundamentally different understanding of the universe. We're talking about Picasso. When this painting came out in 1907, The Women of Avignon, the world had just not seen anything like this, where the aesthetic weight of the forms took on the uh, aesthetic subject matter, for, for, I forget the exact term, uh, and gave rise to the whole cubism movement after it. Right? So this is the highest levels of creativity. Now, one thing to think about as we move into the computational analysis, it, it's now the case that when we judge machines and their ability to be creative, we are judging them by the standards that I've just shown you. Right? This is a clip from the movie I, Robot, starring Will Smith. It came out in 2003. Okay, watch the scene quickly. Symphony. Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? Right? 
We're demanding something of machines that very few of us can really aspire to. Um, you know, there was an article in MIT uh, magazine that came out just a month ago where a philosopher argued that an AI cannot be artistic. And he argues it, I think, by just heightening the definition of creativity to exclude machines. He's talking about you know, transformational creativity and not the creativity that many of us actually aspire to. Okay, here's the challenge for computational creativity. When we talk about creativity, it usually involves some nebulous, mysterious process, right? Karen Armstrong wrote, a creative genius comes back from this undiscovered country, like one of the heroes of antiquity who has wrestled something back from the gods and brought it to mankind. Here's the challenge when we think about a sentiment like that from a computational uh, perspective. If creativity isn't magic, it's not immediately obvious that it could be achieved or modeled by the particular types of non-magic offered by artificial intelligence. And that is what we need to think about when we talk about computational creativity. Okay, so let's go through um, the various efforts to get machines to do creative things since the dawn of the computer age. And it begins, one of the earliest examples is that of a British artist named Harold Cohen who was also skilled with computer science. And he began this work in 1973, and he wanted to know what are the minimum conditions that I need to create in a machine to generate something of creative value. So he was a painter, a computer scientist, and he created a machine called Aaron and had it generate things, and this was one of the first artifacts that it generated, or one of the artifacts that it generated. And to do this, he had to teach it about perspective and colors and so forth. And here's what's fascinating about this. The response of the scientific and artistic communities was very different. The computer science community, you've got to remember this is the 70s when most people don't even know what a computer is, said this is an example of the potential of machines. This is what they can do. They can do creative things. The artistic community said the, the machine didn't do anything. The machine is simply doing what its programmer programmed it to do. The creativity lies not with the machine. It lies with the individual who programmed the machine. And so Cohen later remarked, if Aaron is not making art, what is it exactly? And in what ways, other than its origin, does it differ from the real thing? If it is not thinking, what exactly is it doing? Okay. Another element and another challenge with creativity is that creativity is also what we call discordance. Right? It's about moving away from the path of worn tradition. And so when we understand it from that perspective, how can a system that is algorithmic, that you know, is based on what you tell it to do, how can it ever do something beyond what you're telling it to do? Right? Or as it says here, if a machine can only do what it's programmed to do, how can it ever exhibit what we, what we might term creative behavior? Here's where we get into the implementation. So there has been an evolution of art and mathematics if we think about the, the, you know, the kind of evolution of human knowledge. And so what we can do is we can leverage the mathematics behind chaotic systems and fractals to, to be the seed for generative techniques in the creative realm, right? Does anybody know what this is? Mandelbrot. The Mandelbrot set, right. This was fractals that were uh, discovered in, you know, I think it was 1975 or 1973. And what's fascinating about these shapes is that they're generated based on a few lines of computer code. And as you sort of dive into the shape, it repeats itself ad nauseum. Uh, with beautiful, you know, patterns. And, you know, um, this is all based on, you know, just fundamental mathematics. Uh, Carl Sagan used the concept of mathematics being embedded into the universe in his book, uh, you know, Contact. And so what we can do is we can use the mathematics of, of fractals and chaos to start generating creative artifacts. So not surprisingly, some of the first creative artifacts that we see is fractal art. Right, which uses the mathematics of fractals, adds a little bit of randomization, and creates you know, fairly beautiful patterns. Um, here's the work of a Slovenian artist, and here's the work of a Canadian artist. Right? So what we are trying to do then with computational creativity is to somehow leverage the mathematics of you know, randomness and fractals and so forth, and really achieve something called effective complexity. So you don't want complete randomization. That would just be white noise. You don't want order, because that would be too predictable. You want something in between. And if you can have a mathematical system that gives you enough random behavior so as not to be completely random, that can start to be the basis for creative artifacts. 
And so we can use chance as a generator, right, to actually start generating uh, different artifacts. So let, let's take a look at some of these generative techniques. Um, one of the ways that we instruct the computer as to what it should be developing is to use the concept of a grammar, right? And so a grammar simply tells us, you know, the rules of, let's say, a language, right? The, you know, the adverb, verb relationship, vowels, and so forth. Those of you who studied computer programming, when you learned about language and compilers and stuff, you learned about grammars. And so what we can do is we can take the concept of a grammar and then use generative techniques and have a machine do things within the confines of the grammar. So here is um, a system called JAPE that used grammar and generative techniques. This is the Joke Analysis and Production Engine. Right, right away out of the gate, it's unfunny. But they basically programmed this to try to make English jokes based on its understanding of English. So here's some of the jokes, guys. What do you call a depressed train? A locomotive. What do you call a strange market? A bizarre bazaar. Some laughs. What kind of murderer has fiber? Serial killer, I heard it, yeah. What's the difference between leaves and a car? Nobody's gonna get this. One you brush and rake, the other you rush and break. I sent this to my sister, she's like, why is dad telling jokes still? <laughs> Here's something I want you to think about. So, this is an interesting quote. In generative literature, there certainly also is an author, but one who has not really written the text which is being presented to the reader. His function is not the one we usually assign to an author. The difference is this author is something like a meta-author trying to define what literature is for him and how his literary conception can be formally described. Okay, what does that mean? It means when you look at a creative artifact generated by a machine, there's two levels on which you should think about it. On the first level, think about it just as a regular piece of artwork, right? If it was done by a human, is there beauty, is there creative value, et cetera, et cetera. But the second level is, why does the machine think this is beautiful? Why would a machine think that is funny, right? You're also getting insight into the machine's understanding of that creative art form, which is, which is, a, which is an interesting layer underneath the surface layer of whether or not something is beautiful. Okay, another example of generative technique. This is David Cope, uh, Experiments in Musical Intelligence. He originally wrote this system for his own compositions to inject some randomness and some chance into his musical comp uh, com compositions. And then he realized he could leverage it for other musical styles and combine styles that had never existed before. So what he did was he took the idea of a Polish marzuka, which is a Polish folk dance, and basically had uh, the machine create a marzuka that was based on the pianist of Chopin, and this was the result, which apparently is quite real. Is it playing? Do you have the volume on? Okay, it didn't work. Hmm. Let's try one more time. machine generated. Another type of um, generative technique is a Lindemeyer system, what's known as L system. And so this is a parallel rewriting system where you start with a seed and you build upon it, right? So A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, and you keep building around that, and based on that technique, you get some generative artifact. And so you have a simple recursion of a tree based on branches, very, very simple. Um, the Kapinski triangle, right, where you subdivide a triangle into an infinite number of parts. And then you can add some randomness to it and to start to get some interesting behavior. Um, here's a video from John McCormack called Turbulence that heavily uses the concept of an L system in its generative techniques. I'm gonna play this for you and see if you can see the L system uh, patterns throughout it. Some of his work was actually used in the movie Avatar when they imagined the fictional uh, planet that uh, some of the creatures lived in.
haunting, evocative imaginations in people, eh? Um, did you see the L systems there with the branches and some, some of the creatures and so forth? Um, another generative technique is what's called the Markov model. And uh, those of you familiar with machine learning will be familiar with Markov models. Here, you are trying to predict the next sequence in a generative artifact based on where you are currently and the transition between those sequences, right? And so what you could say is, you know, if I have these three letters or, you know, these three words in the English language, what's going to be the next word? You'll see this in Google just when you type sometimes, right? And you'll see all the weird things that are frankly disturbing based on what you're typing in. Not you, but the fact that humans are regularly searching for that kind of thing. Um, and so Markov models are another generative technique. Here's one of the most famous ones historically. So some of you, the elders among you, might remember news groups before we had the regular internet where you could you know, uh, talk to people over bulletin board services and such. So somebody created a Markov model based on his analysis of the net.single news group, which was the first kind of dating sites, let's say. And so he had a, a Markov system which analyzed all the content in these single news groups and started generating its own responses to that news group. And so here, you guys read it up here, was one of the postings just based on its analysis of words. And it looks eer eerily coherent in a bizarre kind of way. Okay, you know what the most shameful thing about this is? Is that apparently, maybe this is apocryphal, I don't know, people actually tried to date this virtual entity. I don't know if that's a comment on the sophistication of intelligence or very, very low standards amongst people who use BBSs in the 1980s. Okay. Another uh, concept that is really central to the idea of computational creativity is that of an agent. And an agent actually dates all the way back to Plato, who said the world consists of concepts, objects, and agents. And it really just means the capacity to act. Right? So objects are not proactive. A rock will just sit there, whereas an organism has the capacity to behave and enact behavior in the real world. And so naturally, if we think about that in the concept of creativity, there's artificial agents, right? Which are artificial entities that can act in some way. And we have virtual agents, which exhibit behavior, but not in the physical form. And then we have artificial physical agents, like robots that actually are actualized in the real world. And when we talk about computational creativity, what is fascinating is what we call a multi-agent system. So this is a system with many parts, and those parts can combine to give rise to behavior. Right? And central to this concept of the multi-agent is that of emergence. And so emergence occurs when something becomes more than the sum of its parts. Probably the most profound example of emergence is what I told you before about the human brain. Inside the human brain, we have about 100 billion neuro neurons, 100 trillion axons. In isolation, they don't do much. They simply amplify or mitigate electrical signals, and that's all they do. But in combination, they give rise to the rich, subjective, interior experience, which you are all exercising now. And we see emergence really throughout the physical world, quantum mechanics, uh, insects, and so forth. right? And connected to that idea is something called swarm intelligence, okay? which is basically that you can have, again, many, many different parts of the system which exhibit complex radical behavior when combined. Uh, there's a beautiful article you can still find in National Geographic, The Genius of Swarms, where you know, biologists for years have studied ants. And they studied these very, very complex um, ant holes in Africa, like eight, you know, eight feet high, complex ventilation systems, can withstand the weather, like remarkable complexity in these structures. And an individual ant can't make them. But in combination, somehow the entire colony can do this, right? As somebody writes, ants aren't smart. Ant colonies are. A colony can solve problems unthinkable for individual ants, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, if we think about the finding of food, ants have a very basic mechanism. They go in random. The minute they find food, they come back to the nest and they leave a scent. And if another ant hits that scent, that's a hint of which way to go. And over time, They'll start randomly, but gradually, gradually, they start to exhibit complex behavior based on very, very simple rules. Okay, nature is incredible that way. Um, in case you're wondering, occasionally, the entire system can break down. So the pheromone field that the ants used to communicate will sometimes get disturbed, and the whole system breaks down. This is called a death spiral. This is where the ants just circle randomly 
until they die because something in their communication system has been affected. Okay, as a child, I used to burn ants with magnifying glasses. Having a system like this would have been so much more fun than our primitive technique. Okay, so not surprisingly, people have appropriated this concept in something called swarm art. And so swarm art basically tries to generate complex behavior based on smaller systems. And so this is Deschamps descending staircase, which shows temporal evolution. And so this is kind of drawing on that idea you know, using the algorithms and ants and so forth to generate, you know, paintings that have some of those patterns. Um, we've also taken multi-agent systems and we've surveyed many paintings and created an impressionist-based painting based on, you know, many images. So some interesting generative techniques as well. And then we can get more fancy and actually have a kind of live system that reveals structure based on the concept of decaying sense that ants leave when they find food. It's a really, really creative thing that uh, various artists have come up with. Okay. Um, let's talk about some of the other challenges about when we talk about creativity. Um, so be, being a writer, um, one of my favorite um, areas of creative expression is literary style, beautiful language, flowery language. And, you know, one of the most beautiful and disturbing books of the past century was Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, right? And if you think about how it opens, Lolita, light of my life, far of my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita, tip of the tongue, like very rhythmic and beautiful language. Uh, writers often joke that, you know, God gave Nabokov the ability to write the most beautiful language, but he also damned him to write about the most demented subject matter. Because for those of you that have read Lolita, it's about a man essentially lusting after a 10-year-old girl and you have such cognitive dissonance reading the book because it's so beautifully written, but you know, it's about very disturbing subject matter, right? But let's nonetheless concentrate on the literary style and beautiful language and so forth. Um, it's hard to define what makes a sentence eloquent. Nonetheless, what machine learning scientists are doing now is they are taking the entire corpus of 19th century and 20th century literature in the open source, and they are starting to analyze it mathematically and trying to understand the cadence of words and word choices and how you know, different vocabulary resonates with the audience. It's just you know, remarkable. Um, the engineer in me can certainly appreciate this. right? This is a very difficult engineering task that machine learning scientists are starting to tackle. The artist in me kind of dies a little bit. Like, How can you take beautiful words and try to destruct them mathematically? Like, That's not what language is about. Language is not about mathematics, it's about how it moves us, right? Um, but nonetheless, I think that probably the very first chess grandmasters thought the same thing when machines started playing very strong chess. How can you take my inspiration and you know, devolve it into a mathematical system? But I would contend that when we come to literature, there's an even more fundamental problem than generating just beautiful language, okay? And this illustrates probably the most fundamental challenge when we talk about computational creativity. Does anybody know where this picture is from? I heard it. Les Miserables, yeah. Okay, how many people here have seen the play or have read the book Les Mis? Okay, so about maybe half of us. So I heard a neuroscientist speaking about this particular play in the context of creativity. And what he said was the following. There's a scene in Les Mis where the protagonist in the play, Jean Valjean, right? He's jailed at the age, I think, of 13 for stealing bread for his starving sister. And in revolutionary France, he's jailed for you know, 20 years, and he gets out, or 25 years, whatever it is, and he gets out of jail, and he's a broken individual. right? And a priest is kind enough to take him in and to let him stay the night, and he steals from the priest. Steals from the priest, and he leaves, and the cops catch him, and they bring him back to the priest, and they say, you know, Monsieur, we, we caught this man stealing from you. Here's your stuff, and we're going to arrest him again. And the priest looks over Jean Valjean. Then he looks at the police and he says, he didn't steal from me. I gave him these things. And in fact, Jean Valjean, you forgot the candle hold sticks, right? And somebody's saying that in that moment, we see the narrative arc of this character change. Because somebody, against all the odds, has found hope in this individual where really there is no cause for hope. And that's what we resonate with in this play. That's the seminal moment 
that begins his redemption. So here's the question. To conjure a scene like that, either in literary form or in a movie or in a poem, do you not have to understand something about the concept of human redemption? And if you don't understand that, how can you ever concoct a beautiful scene like that? So here's the question, really, when we're talking about computational creativity. It's one thing to say we have generative techniques. It's one thing to say that we can do all these fancy things. Can a machine understand our emotions and produce creative artifacts that move us in that emotional way? That is one of the difficult questions. Okay? Somebody said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Does anybody know who said that? Quoted quite a bit. Anybody? Martin Luther King. And he was actually paraphrasing a Protestant minister. Take a look at some of the language in the most probably famous American speech, I Have a Dream. Right? King was such a powerful speaker, very few people... Uh, realized he was also a very accomplished writer. And look at some of his word choices. You know, the tranquilizing drug of gradualism, right? His word choices are very, very clever because they have an emotional appeal to a specific audience. They work on one level, but they work on a deeper level. Does anybody know why would a phrase like the tranquilizing drug of gradualism have such an effect on an audience in the 60s civil rights era in the United States? The word tranquilize is especially poignant. Anybody know? Well, the very first slaves, you know, African-American slaves, were tranquilized like animals. And so when he's using that phrase, he's using it in a way that we would understand, you know, in terms of its allegorical effects, but he's using it also literally because it resonates with a people in the United States who are suddenly coming of age and demanding rights. You know, the sweltering heat of injustice. He has his other letters, uh, you know, Reflections in a Birmingham House Jail, where he talks about, at one time, half the county in Alabama, all the African Americans were unjustly jailed. And he talks about the injustice and seething rage, but just sitting in your jail cell in silence and having sweat drip down your forehead. Sweltering injustice. He's using it to appeal to an audience. Can a machine ever do that? Can it understand that context and generate something that appeals to us on such a resonant level. Okay, this is one of um, uh, the pictures that I really um, come back to time to time in our difficult political times. And um, this is a picture from an article that appeared in the New York Times the day after Obama was elected. And the writer says, a black mother and daughter sit on the floor of a church in Harlem. The mother, Latrice Barnes, having heard of Obama's victory, is doubled up in tears. Her daughter, Jasmine, is reaching a tentative hand up to soothe her. To me, she looks like the future reaching out to heal the past. Right? And she goes on to say, can this younger daughter really understand why her mother's crying? She can understand her mother's crying and, and, and console her, but unless you've been an African American in the United States for 30 years, can you appreciate the symbolic emotional significance of your own, so to speak, ascending to the highest office in the land. It's that kind of emotion that we're trying to achieve when we talk about the highest forms of creativity, okay? And that's one of the challenges for it. So let me show you, finally, the cutting edge stuff that we do have in computational creativity. Some of you may have heard of GANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks, right? These are neural networks that basically can create creative artifacts by having two neural networks, one of which creates fake artifacts, one of which tries to determine whether or not they're fake. And they perform iteratively and get better and better. And so these are cats that do not exist, that are created with GANs. These are pictures of cats, and these cats don't exist. They are generated purely based on the neural network's understanding of what cats look like. OK, remember, another thing that cr computational creativity should do is enable new forms of creative expression. So this is one of the latest ones from Google that allows you to paint in 3D. Take a look. Can you try that on? I had seen some videos of, of the technology, but actually using it, it's a totally different world. Whoa. Oh, oh, holy. Whoa, 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 whoa. When people first put it on, it's crazy. They start painting in front of them. But then when they start to turn and realize, like, 
oh, wait a second, I can be inside of my own painting? That's nuts. Whoa, whoa. You can walk right into it. Woo, that's crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. I happen to love flatness. Two dimensions is almost too much trouble. Making the lines for the first time, I realized I'm not drawing the illusion of three-dimensional space. I can actually pull with my tool to make the person's arm go out. You're circling the work and you're creating the work, but the work circling you is something unusual. It was like you're dreaming. So it's like creating art in your dreams. You lose sense of time, you lose sense of space, and you don't even care. Everything else just disappears. Doing it is like nothing you've experienced. Cool, eh? um, here's the, the last generative technique I want to tell you about, which is generative design tools. And this is about how we generate artifacts within a given space, but in unique ways that won't occur to a human being. Tools are making this leap from being passive to being generative. Generative design tools use a computer and algorithms to synthesize geometry, to come up with new designs all by themselves. All it needs are your goals and your constraints. I'll give you an example. In the case of this aerial drone chassis, all you would need to do is tell it something like it has four propellers, you want it to be as lightweight as possible, and you need it to be aerodynamically efficient. And then what the computer does is it explores the entire solution space, every single possibility that solves and meets your criteria, millions of them. It takes big computers to do this. But it comes back to us with designs that we, by ourselves, never could have imagined. And the computer is coming up with this stuff all by itself. No one ever drew anything, and it started completely from scratch. Now, what's exciting is we're starting to see this technology out in the real world. We've been working with Airbus for a couple of years on this concept plane for the future. Now, it's a ways out still. But just recently, we used a generative design AI to come up with this. This is a 3D printed cabin partition that's been designed by a computer it's stronger than the original, yet half the weight. And it'll be flying in the Airbus A320 later this year. So computers can now generate. They can come up with their own solutions to our well-defined problems. So here's an interesting question. You know, that, that you know, door that it created, is that creative? It's better than what we can design. It's smaller, it weighs less, it's stronger. But is that truly creative? Interesting question. Uh, let me just take a moment and briefly tell you what we do, because it's very connected to what you just saw. So deep learning neural networks are really powerful. They have three challenges. They're very difficult to build. You need an incredible level of expertise. They're very expensive to run. And number three, even when you get them to run, you can't explain them. You'll often hear about the black box problem in AI. What that means is that you can train a neural network to do something, but you don't know why it's reaching those conclusions. Um, and that's a huge challenge. So what we did, or not what I did, what my professors did at University of Waterloo, they said, okay, these networks are so complex, the only way that we can help crack some of these problems is to use AI. So we use traditional machine learning to understand deep learning neural networks, and then we generate new neural networks that are about a hundredth the size, as good, but can be explained. And so the speed up that we get is, is pretty incredible. This is 100 perception networks running on a single GPU. Uh, this is you know, a pose network, again, running on a GPU. This is the increase in frame weight we get um, on embedded devices, you know, four frames a second to 158 frames a second. But probably the coolest thing is explainability, is being able to explain how neural networks reach their decisions. Uh, let me give an example. One of our autonomous vehicle clients, they ran into a bizarre situation where their car would turn increasingly left with increasing statistical frequency when the color of the sky was a certain shade of purple. Why would a car turn left more often than right because the, the sky was purple? They only realized that once we explained it to them. Then they went back to their training data and said, oh, 
We did the training for this particular turning scenario in the Nevada desert when the sky was that shade of purple, and that's what the machine had connected, right? Color of the sky is this, I should turn left. Important thing about neural networks is that they are not modeling reality, they are modeling the data that you give it. And the data, if it's based on humans, is biased, flawed, incomplete, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Some of you may have heard there was a system in the United States, in, in Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, the Supreme Court declared that a machine learning system should determine parole for inmates, thinking the machine would be more neutral than people. Problem was, they trained it on historical data. Guess what? African Americans got harsher sentences than anybody else, because it was based on old data. So that's something that's very important to realize. This is a system we actually, um, this is a self-driving perception system that we used our explainability technology on. We're highlighting in blue things that cause the car to turn right and red things that cause it to turn left. Most amazing thing about this analysis, the car isn't using the lanes to steer, so much of this is using the obstacles to the left and the right of the vehicle. When we showed this to the designers, they thought, oh no, what happens when we put this on a desert road where there are no obstacles? And guess what, it went right off the road. Self-driving cars, here we come, right? Um, okay, so how do we make sense of all this? You can probably see that we are far away from the type of creativity that moves us. But I wanna just conclude with something Immanuel Kant wrote. So he's a philosopher that wrote very soulfully about what he, what he called the sublime. And he says there's two kind of feelings of the sublime we get. There's the mathematically sublime, and that is the feelings of satisfaction that you get with something that is really intellectually satisfying. A mathematical theorem, a painting, a clever word phrase, and so forth. But then he said, there's a more powerful type of the sublime, which he termed the dynamically sublime. Right? The incomprehensibility of nature. Um, an experience that you really can't quantify in words. Right, so uh, my wife and I had our first child about four months ago. My, wife, uh, my son is four months old, and I experienced this recently because one of my favorite things to do with my son is in the morning, we swaddle him. You learn all these things as a parent, right? He's, his hands are tied. And in the morning, I would love to unswaddle him and just see him stretch. And what was amazing was that about the two month mark, he started learning that I liked seeing him do that. And then I would do it and he'd smile and, I, and like that feeling, and the parents in the here, I, I see many of you nodding, the feeling that you get when your own flesh and blood has you know, feelings and so forth and evolves into a human being really give you that indescribable experience, right? And it's that indescribable experience that the highest art forms, the Shakespeare's of this world, are aspiring to when they write and paint and so forth. So what are we trying to do with computational creativity? We are trying to get you to experience the dynamically sublime, but we're trying to get you to do that through the mathematically sublime, right? And that is the real fundamental challenge for computational creativity. And what's most exciting is given the progress in the past five years, okay, it might not occur in my lifetime, I think it'll probably occur in my son's lifetime. Thank you very much. Okay, I know we're pressed for time, so I'm gonna give it back to Dragos, and uh, he's got a few things to do, right? We have time for two or three questions. We have time for two or three questions, okay. Uh, I come originally from the <laughs> from the field of psychology, and okay. I do some art therapy, but I'm also into artificial intelligence and okay. so on. And, well, what occurs to me is that there is a lot of research from psychology uh -huh. about creativity. Yeah. And most of it, I will I'll have to say, is not very good. It's not very creative, oddly enough. <laughs> but there are some exceptions to the rule, okay? And, for example, there is a, a particular research line by Ronald Fink, um, he, he tried to answer the question, how can I help people be more creative? So okay. what are the conditions that I have to ensure for people to be more creative? And he did a very good job. He had a very wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, experimental paradigm and so on and so forth. And he, okay. came, he, he came... What's the question? Uh, well, uh, he came with some ideas and so on. So the question is, do you... Um, um, are you applying some kind of some parts of that research from psychology, oh, from a cognitive science into this field? Can you do that? Do you think that's promising? What a great question. So my wife's a psychiatrist, and so she says some of the most creative people 
are also the most unbalanced, let's say. Um, somebody tried, no joke, to look at the effects of LSD on the brain and tried to emulate that in a neural network to engender creative behavior. So there is actually some active research with people with your subject matter expertise and you know, pairing themselves with computer scientists to try to understand, I think it's probably on a, on a more neuroscientific level, of trying to understand what's happening in the brain neuroscientifically. It's no coincidence that a lot of our great artists, uh, Dostoevsky, Bobby Fischer, were geniuses in the creative realm, but also suffered from some type of mental illness, schizophrenia and so forth. And people have, for years have been trying to find out what's the line between that. And there is some active research in trying to take the neuroscientific mechanisms of creativity and somehow imbue them in neural networks. It's early experimental work, but it is interesting. Um, and so I would recommend you look into some of it. There, there is actually some active research in this area. Yeah. Well, thank you for the, for the speech, for the talk. Uh, you, it seems to me that every attempt at creativity, uh, artificial creativity, or computational creativity, goes through some level of using randomness to simulate, to emulate that spark, that intuitive spark. Have you seen anything, any kind of experiment or any idea that uh, uh, does not go through randomness to, to generate that? Are there any other ways that are, uh, have been tested for that? Yes. Um, so randomness and chance is often used for that. But what you sometimes get is, remember I talked about the concept of emergence? So you get, like AlphaGo is a really good example. Um, and you should watch the documentary because they didn't use randomness with AlphaGo. Or actually they did. They used uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Um, but for the reinforcement learning that they did, they just basically um, you know, had it behave according to a set of rules. And out of those rules, you'll get complex behavior that sometimes, because the system is so complex, you wouldn't have predicted when you put it together. And there's this famous move, move 37, I think it's in game two or three, where this, the, the system plays a move that completely stuns all the experts in the room, and they can't understand it, and it is incredibly creative, and it gave them, gave the humans a fundamentally new way of understanding Go. So it does happen, um, I think, in many systems, though, you do, you do see randomness at some level of the system, but you certainly have creative art, you know, approaches where there is no randomness. And it's based on the learning of data, right? So if you look at neural network training and stuff, there's not necessarily randomness there. You get it from the data set and the emergence of a very complex network. Yeah. Okay, are we doing something here? Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much, Sheldon, for the talk.